Welcome to our final week of geography. Today we'll be discussing the islands of New Zealand and their unique role in the British Empire. Although, um, you'll notice a recurring theme this week. Um, I'm asking you to choose one of the three areas that I'm lecturing on, either New Zealand, New Guinea, or Antarctica, and you're going to be exploring the, uh, the unique environment that they possess from a geographical point of view. You're going to be exploring the culture that they possess of course, if you pick New Zealand or New Guinea, if you pick Antarctica, of course, there won't be any culture to talk about. Although, if you do pick Antarctica, instead, you'll be going over some of the scientific things that are done there. Hopefully, um, one of these three will pique your interest in recognition of the fact that you're going to be doing some outside research. Each one of these lectures will be slightly shorter than normal uh, in case you are worried that you missed something you didn't. Uh, they're intended to be a bit shorter to give you some extra time this week as you work on that research project. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with New Zealand. New Zealand in some ways uh, resembles Australia, but the big difference from a historical point of view is that New Zealand possessed a relatively sophisticated native population and that is going to be a very different um, scenario than what we saw in Australia. Of course Australia had the Aborigines, but the Aborigines as you'll remember were not super developed, did not possess a large number of, of weapons, certainly did not have organization required to really do much in the face of European colonizations. On the other hand, the Maori, the native population of New Zealand, while pro they probably could not have resisted um, steady European attacks, had a sophisticated enough culture and a developed enough um, social interaction that they are going to have the ability to negotiate with Europeans. And that dramatically changes the history of New Zealand. New Zealand was discovered by the exact same explorer that discovered Australia for Europeans, and that was Abel Tasman. But just as we talked about in the history of Australia, just because the place was explored by Europeans simply does not mean that that was when it was first discovered by humans in general. New Zealand, as opposed to Australia, has a pretty firmly established date of arrival for humans, period. And this is one that I think we can agree with our evolutionist friends on, and that is approximately 1000 AD. In 1000 AD, descendants of the Polynesian um, expansion, which had been going on from the island of Taiwan for thousands of years by this point, finally arrived in New Zealand. And New Zealand, by the way, is one of the last locations to which the Polynesian peoples arrived. Um, several outlier islands past New Zealand are colonized by actually descendants of those who landed on New Zealand itself, and it's possible that Easter Island was inhabited later than this, but New Zealand really marks the last stage in Polynesian expansion. And this shouldn't surprise us since New Zealand, while being a continental island itself and being very large and able to support a large population, is very far removed from anything else. A very similar situation to the islands that make up the Sandwich Islands, or as you would better know them, the Hawaiian Islands. Um, they are large and very capable of supporting life, but they're very far from everybody else. And so it takes the Polynesians a long time to make it to New Zealand in numbers large enough to actually form a settlement. Um, interestingly, New Zealand is inhabited by a number of very interesting animals, probably the two most famous of which are birds. We have the moa, which were possibly the largest flightless birds ever to live on planet Earth. We have existent moa skeletons that were in the 12 to 13 foot range. So if you can imagine a bird 12 to 13 feet tall, that's what the moa were. Um, I think the best way to think of them is something like the bird from Up. If you've seen Up, the bird Kevin, um, he would be probably representative of the size of a moa bird. Although for the record, if you've ever seen an ostrich attack something. Um, I'm not sure you would want to meet one of those while you were running around in the middle of the jungle. They would probably be able to kill you, um, if not eat you. I don't think they ate humans, but I'm sure they could kill you nonetheless. The mall was hunted down by these initial Polynesian settlers for a good reason. Can you imagine a 13 foot tall turkey? That's a lot of food. The other very famous bird that eventually goes extinct in New Zealand is the dodo bird, um, which I think probably got its fame in the Ice Age movies. Maybe you've seen those. My wife is playing Animal Crossing right now, and there's dodo birds that fly her all over the place in different islands that she goes to. Uh, but the dodo birds were also large flightless birds. Um, not moa large, but we're talking probably three feet tall, if standing as tall as they could. And again, these are great sources of food, and unfortunately, uh, they are hunted down to extinction. 
Once this is done, the Polynesian population begins to settle into a more settled agriculture and fishing lifestyle. Since they've hunted all of the large game on the island, um, New Zealand does not have a particularly large amount of large animals, very similar to Australia in that regard. And eventually, a population of approximately 100,000 natives develops. And this population peaks around the 14th century and doesn't seem to increase dramatically from the 14th century to approximately the 1700s. The main reason for this is because that seemed to be the limit of what Australia could easily support with its own native agriculture. And most of that native agriculture was tending of the animals such as dogs, chickens, and pigs that the Polynesians had access to. Although actually now that I think about it, I don't think New Zealand had pigs. Uh, pigs are present in many Polynesian locations, but I don't think they're in New Zealand. Um, but they also did have abundant fishing resources, and the Maori made plentiful use of that. They also, unlike most of their Polynesian neighbors, had ready access to large amounts of timber, and so they were able to construct large settlements. They also developed a very sophisticated social structure, and probably the most interesting cultural uh, thing that they're known for is their war dances, which if you've ever seen the New Zealand rugby team uh, play a match, you've seen their war dance beforehand. And if you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, look up the All Blacks rugby team war dance or dance, um, either one, and you can watch that on YouTube. And it's really quite cool. And uh, what they would do, the Maori would go out and they would attempt to intimidate each other before actually fighting a battle. And the idea was that if I can look scared and intimidating and they run away then I win and I don't actually have to you know put myself out there and possibly die this cultural practice by the way is actually present across all of Polynesia and the Maori are just probably the most famous for doing it another thing that the Maori begin to do is to begin to tattoo themselves again for ritual fear reasons primarily other uh, warriors begin to do it and then it becomes absorbed into their cultural practices and they're very famous for having prominent uh, face tattoos or facial tattoos. Some of them have their entire faces tattooed very prominently, which again is something they're quite famous for. And if you've never seen a Maori that's spelled M-A-O-R-I, you should absolutely look them up because I think they are very fierce and intimidating and very cool looking. But again, uh, tattooing was a Polynesian cultural trait, certainly not something that the Maori invented themselves, but that they developed specifically while they were in isolation on New Zealand. Now, when Europeans arrived in the 1600s, there was very limited interaction between them and the Maori. In fact, the Dutch mention a incident with the natives on New Zealand, or what we assume is New Zealand from their records, and the only uh, interference there seems to be an interaction where the Dutch land and are killed by the Maori, and the Dutch ship fires Canada's shot into the Maori, killing several of them. And this led to the rumors that the Maori were cannibals, and there is no particular evidence that the Maori were cannibals. Although, again, we are working with cultures that did not have written language. So whether they ate people in the 1600s or not, I suppose is unknown. But again, the Maori that were later encountered didn't eat people, and so I think we can safely assume that's not what happened to the Dutch. But they were killed. There was some, there was some uh, misunderstandings in the 1600s that led the Dutch not to land there, which really, from a Dutch perspective, is probably a shame because New Zealand, it turns out, is one of the nicest areas um, that any European would ever go and settle. It has almost no disease. It has a climate very similar to most of Europe in many places. Um, it avoids some of the nastiness of Australia. In fact, there's very few things in New Zealand that are actively out to kill you, and I'm sure the Australians would love to have the lessened lethality around. And of course, the continent itself isn't trying to melt you like Australia is either. So New Zealand is a much nicer place to live. And in the late 1700s, the British begin interacting with New Zealand. Now, what surprises many people is the British do not begin colonizing New Zealand, again, for some of the same reasons that they don't colonize Australia before the American colonies are lost. The American colonies are much more convenient from a British perspective. Um, it's not very long to get over there. It only takes about a month, as opposed to Australia, which may have well been on another planet for how long it took to get there and back. In fact, uh, sanitation was so poor on ships and diseases were so rife that making the trip more than once was probably a death sentence. Many people who tried to make the trip multiple times died of disease and you just really didn't want to take that gamble. And so most people that moved to Australia and New Zealand, they moved there permanently. In fact, New Zealand's real only European contact were primarily whalers chasing whales all around the southern parts of the Pacific Ocean. And they would land and trade with the Maori for food and supplies and in exchange they would give out things like uh, weapons, they would give out steel,
and other things of that nature, and they may even sell some whale flesh on their way back. Because of this, the Maori began to be armed, and with these muskets, the Maori began to fight intertribal warfare. Uh, the Maori also picked up the potato from one of these ships, and the potato dramatically transformed the population and the agriculture of New Zealand. While we are confident that there was a major ecological impact from disease in New Zealand. We're also very confident that the Maori numbers actually, after a dip from this population destruction from disease, began to climb rapidly because the potato is an excellent cultivatable agricultural product for New Zealand. New Zealand is very hilly and it does not have a lot of land for traditional agriculture, as in wheat fields but it is very good for growing potatoes. And potatoes allow the Maori population to increase uh, relatively heavily in the 1800s. In fact, it reaches between 200 and 250,000 by the 1840s, which is dramatic considering that most native populations are significantly reduced by their contact with the Europeans. Again, the Maori do suffer from diseases. Unfortunately, they're not able to escape that problem, but they are able to increase their populations through access to these agricultural products. In the 1840s, the Maori began to get word that the French were considering colonizing their island. Now, the British had established formal relations with the Maori early in the 1800s. However, very few British people had settled on the island, and most of them had settled there for specific purposes. And so the Maori had allowed them to come in. The French, on the other hand, apparently were planning to send an official colony, and the Maori decided instead to ask for the British government to colonize them instead. They would rather be subjects of Britain than they would have to deal with the French. And so they effectively invite the British in in the 1840s, and they sign a agreement with the British that will basically uh, dominate how the two sides can interact with each other. Unfortunately, as normally happens in 1843, the British break the agreement and take many pieces of territory from the Maori or redistribute them in the ways the Maori were not expecting them to. And by the way, actually a modern Maori groups are suing the New Zealand government for some of these treaty obligations and the New Zealand government is recognizing, oh, uh, we made a mistake and they're trying to rectify that, which I think is good on them. And so this treaty actually is still relevant even today. Some, some of the claims are still being legislated about in New Zealand itself. From the 1840s on, we have significant increase in European settlement in New Zealand itself. First, the primary focus is on the North Island, which again, because it's in the Southern Hemisphere, is actually the more temperate of the two islands. But eventually, there is also European involvement in the Southern Island. And the, the capital of New Zealand is eventually selected as Wellington. The main reason it's selected is because of its proximity across, between the two islands. Um, the South Island was considering becoming its own colony, and the North Island wanted to maintain its control over the South Island, so they moved the capital down to Wellington, which is just on the north side of the Cook Strait, which separates North and South uh, New Zealand. New Zealand would continue to grow eventually in the early 1900s, it would receive its status as a dominion of the British Empire. That means that it is effectively self-ruling. And while it still adhered to some of the decisions of the British Parliament, most local decisions were left in the hands of native New Zealanders. As mentioned in the Australia lectures, New Zealand would then go on to participate in both world wars, um, sending less troops than Australia because it had a smaller population, but still well represented based on the percentage of men who chose to go serve. And these Australian and New Zealand troops are often called the ANZACs, which stands for the Australian and New Zealand Auxiliary Corps. And these guys went and they served in the Middle East during World War I and all across the British Empire in World War II. Uh, New Zealand troops fought everywhere from France to India to the campaigns in the islands. And again, as earlier mentioned, the United States supply lines through to Australia and also to New Zealand helped the two nations stay in war. New Zealand didn't have the same military resources as Australia, but still played an important role in World War II as a United States ally. Now, New Zealand, after the 1940s, experienced a major economic boom, as did much of the allied world, the democratic world, after World War II. Although Australia found itself more and more in the limelight for its a very unusual geography, and um, Australia, excuse me, New Zealand is oftentimes called the Southern Alps for its beautiful mountains, especially in the Southern Island. And if you've never seen pictures of New Zealand, you really need to look them up because uh, I think you would be hard pressed to find a more beautiful location in all of the world. This beauty is appreciated by two separate groups of people. Number one, uh, New Zealand is oftentimes considered the extreme sports capital of the world. 
world if you like things like skydiving, mountain climbing, or any other extreme sport. New Zealand has it in spades. In fact, Wellington has the most certified extreme sports enthusiast of anywhere in the world. So if you have been ever interested in doing something extreme, a New Zealand would be a great option. Another thing that New Zealand is popular for is films, and specifically the films that probably really put New Zealand on the map from a filming perspective were the Lord of the Rings movies. If you've ever seen the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, you have actually seen a very good representation of New Zealand's absolutely gorgeous geography. And if you haven't seen the, new, the, the Lord of the Rings movies, well, you're in quarantine right now, so I highly encourage you to go watch them. You can call it a geography exercise to go see New Zealand, uh, because again, it is it is awe-inspiring, breathtaking. In fact, if you do go watch those movies, you might think to yourself, that place cannot possibly be real. But it is real, okay? Ignore, you know, the CGI things running all over those places, but all of the locations are really places that exist in New Zealand, at least from an exterior perspective. So very, very impressive place and uh, definitely one that you should look up if you have not looked it up previously. With all of that said, that's all I have for you on New Zealand. Again, if New Zealand interests you, I encourage you to pick them as your research subject for this week. I think New Zealand has a very fascinating history. It's a beautiful place that's definitely worth your attention. Until next time, have a great day.